Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We are continuing with our talk series in SOFI 2020, International Webinar, SOFI 2020, Sustainable Ornamental Fisheries Way Forward. Welcome to the speaker, John Dawes. John Dawes is an internationally renowned authority on fish, aquaria, ponds, and water gardening. Former editor of British monthly hobby magazine, Aquarist and Pond Keeper. Secretary General of OFI, Ornamental Fish International, for 10 years. After a long gap in 2015, he resumed as editor of OFI. John has written over 5,000 articles in consumer and trade publications, as well as several in scientific educational journals in many countries world over and contributed to more than 50 books. He was editorial consultant and later chief editor for Aquarama magazine. John Dawes was consultant to Intermedium Publishers BV, the Netherlands for Eurozoo 91 and to Expo Consult Singapore. Aquaria China 2004, Aquaria China 2006, Aquarama Consultant from 1987 to 2015. Aquarelm consultant, consultant in 2017 in Singapore. John has been a member of judging panels at shows as far as a field as Florida and Singapore and has acted as chief judge at Aquarama. In May 2005, John and his wife and business partner Vivian received a special award from Ornamental Fish International for their contributions to the international ornamental aquatic industry. Hearty welcome, John Dawes. The screen is Hello. all yours. The screen is all mine. That's, that's yes. nice. Um, it's strange how things change. By the way, that's, that's, that's wonderful. I, I, at one stage, I said, who's she talking about? Now, this was a lovely introduction. Um, but um, I was thinking when you said the screen is yours, that um, up to very, very recently, when we used to attend uh, conferences uh, physically, one would say, the stage is yours. How things have changed. The screen is yours now. So anyway, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I'd like to extend uh, a warm welcome to whoever has joined us from the 1,500 people who have registered. Uh, welcome one and all, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy uh, the next few minutes and some of the pictures that uh, I have to show you um, about Aquarama. So I'm going to share my screen and hope it works this time. I'm trying... Mm -hmm. There we go. Have I got it right, Mini? Yes, I have. Can you hear me, Mini? Yes, very well. And I've got it right, have I? Well, you can start. You may start now. Okay, here we are. This is uh, this is the topic that uh, uh, that Mini. Back slide, slide. Sorry? Previous slide. No, I can't, I can't get to, I says that, ah, uh, it hasn't got at the top, the start Don't of the slideshow. Don't worry, start from here, please. But if you can, if you can, can see this, you can see this, can't you? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Back. Uh, okay. John, okay, then just... we're okay. I can use this method. Okay, so I'm John Dawes, and uh, as uh, Minnie said, um, I'm the editor of the Ophi Journal, and I was the former Aquarama consultant up to 2015. Uh, this was uh, one of the shots taken at Aquarama because at every staging of Aquarama, we used to invite um, a special guest, and the special guest was usually a government uh, officer. In this case, this was a, a gentleman called Dr. Mohammed Maliki bin Osman, 
uh, a senior parliamentary secretary. And I put this on because this, gen this gentleman was quite special because unlike other people who you can invite to become a guest of honor, this man was actually a fish keeper. And uh, as we took him around, he could ask the right questions. He knew what he was talking about and it was a huge pleasure having, having him around. We'll, we'll see him uh, a little bit later. Okay, so here we go. In order to talk before talking about Aparama, I'd like to take one small step back. This was to 1987, where as you can see from this, uh, there was the Singapore International Ornamental Fish Exposition. This was held in the grounds of what was then the Van Cleef Aquarium, which no longer exists, in the grounds of Fort Canning Park. And um, I don't think Fort Canning, Fort Canning Park actually exists anymore. And this was organized by SAFIA, the Singapore Aquarium Fish Exporters Association. And they invited me along to act as, as a judge. There I am with a lot more hair and uh, a lot fewer years. And uh, this was quite a good show. It was a very, very interesting event. Um, but it was held outdoors, as you can see. And there I am judging Furnished Aquaria with uh, Dr. Violet Pang from uh, NUS, National University of Singapore. So this was a very interesting show. And that was the first time I came across giant uh, orandas and fish like that. And after the show, I was talking to uh, the organizers who were Safia, and they asked my opinion. And I said, this is fantastic. But what you're looking for is a shop window to the world. And uh, the shop window to the world, I'm afraid that you as busy fish, uh, businessmen, that you can't provide that because you're very busy running your businesses. So therefore, you will need an official exhibition organizer. Now, if you could get somebody like that, then you can relax, you can brief the people, and these professionals will take the show on and they will be able to organize um, an international event. Um, and that was the birth uh, two years later of Aquarama, Aquarama 2009. Please ignore, ignore, ignore this. This was just that I couldn't find a slide of Aquarama 2009. Uh, so from 2009 onwards, uh, the show was in the hand of professional um, exhibition organizers and they moved the show first to the World Trade Center and subsequently to this impressive location right in the heart of Singapore which is called Suntech. This is a reflection of how far the show moved in a very very short space of time. It truly became international and from the word go uh, international exhibitors were booking space and from the word go, there was the demand for an international show, a fish show, a competitive event. So signs were good. And uh, look at how popular it became, because always from, from the very first event onwards, there were always huge crowds waiting to come into the event. And just scanning this photograph, you will see that while there are lots of Asian and Southeast Asian people here, there are lots of non-Asians. This was the, the pulling the magnet of Singapore and the magnet of uh, Aquarama. It was an exciting event that was coming onto the scene and uh, it attracted people worldwide. Opening ceremony, you see, there's that gentleman again, Dr. Mohammed Maliki bin Osman. At the, there's always, there was always a very glamorous um, opening ceremony at which uh, the OFI, the, the then OFI president was always invited. Um, there was an address from the managing director of uh, the, the, the organizing uh, company or the owners of, of the show. And then this is part of the um, invited invited audience at the, at the opening ceremony. I'm showing you this slide just to give you a flavor of, of Aquarama. Inside, it was very glamorous. It was always packed. 
and uh, people came from far and wide. A very, very exciting, colorful, bright uh, event. Let's go now. Some of the key elements is that uh, in addition to the show itself, there was always a series of free public seminars. Anybody could come in, sit down and enjoy the talks. Um, and we always had leading figures. In this particular case, that's Scott Dowd from the New England Aquarium. And here is one of our speakers who will be speaking tomorrow, Tim Miller Morgan. So we always had names of people who could come and talk authoritatively about, about the subject. And uh, this was a popular feature of, uh, of Aquarama. We also frequently had uh, these panel discussions in which uh, the, the, the audience, as you saw in the previous slide, they would be, we had a panel of speakers and so on, and they could just fire questions at us. And uh, this give and take on, a very, on an informal basis was wonderful. It was well, well attended. Another feature of Aquarama were the workshops. We used to organize workshops at every event. And this particular one was uh, a very interesting one because it was dedicated to the, the relationship between public aquaria and the ornamental aquatic industry. Now, at, at this particular workshop, we had a number of presentations and then the people who were attending, the attendees would break up into groups and they would tackle a number of specific tasks on the subject of public aquaria and on the ornamental aquatic industry, how the, in, uh, the, the relationship could be uh, improved, what should happen, what should not happen, and, and so on. Um, uh, I, I'll have to use the, 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 uh, the arrow at the bottom, that's it's safe a bit. Um, and as a result of that, people used to note down their thoughts as to what was important, which factors, needed to be taken into consideration and which needed to be knocked into some sort of working summary. Uh, this was then subsequently done and distributed to, to everybody. Incidentally, I don't know if she's watching, but that's Marie Belzan, Belzan who joined us yesterday uh, on, one, on one of the talks. Let's carry on. Now, let's get to the competition itself. The competition, as you can see, was massive. Uh, we got to the point where we, we actually had 1,400 tanks. Now that's a lot of water, and that's a lot of tanks, and it's a lot of fish. Um, all these rows here, you can, you, can, you can make them out. These are the legendary dragonfish, which uh, I, I will be showing some lovely pictures later on. Then there were all the individual, the goldfish, the betas, the corridoras, and so on. These were uh, marine tanks. We had uh, furnished freshwater tanks. Um, you'll see what we had. You see, this uh, most of the fish, other than the dragonfish, were housed in tanks behind these boards. And behind this, um, we had all the, the workings, the filters, the pumps, the lighting, and everything, so that the tanks could be maintained and the water quality ensured during the whole, the whole of the event. Here we go. Now, this is the panel of judges for 2013. As you can see, there's a lot of judges. There was an international exhibition that was uh, popular throughout the world, and therefore we invited judges from throughout the world. Uh, you will recognize some people there's Spain, Spain for so, who's already spoken to us. There's the gentleman I mentioned earlier, Scott Dowd. So we had Norway, we had Denmark, Finland, Tor Kreutzmann, Australia, uh, somewhere in here, I think we should have, there he is. There's our president, Shane Willis. We had Belgium, we had Germany, Bernd Dagen. Uh, we had Mexico, uh, Serafin Almenara from Dan. We had Singapore, there's uh, Pauline Teo. And this guy here, I'd like to mention him because his name is Ling Kai Huat. And he was the curator of the Van Cleef Aquarium. Remember the first shot I showed you where we had uh, the, the show uh, organized by Safia? He was curator of the aquarium at the time. And he used to work for what was the PPD, which became the Agri Food and Veterinary Association of Singapore, which is now the ABS, the managing, managing director. And this lady here, 
I'd like to mention her because her name is Jennifer Lee. She became Pranic Project Manager for the last two events that I was involved in, the 2013 and 2015 events. And she was exceptionally good. She had to be because she had to control all of us, including me. There's a judge from Bahrain, Julian Sprang from the US. There's our past Secretary General, Alex Brook, who, as was mentioned uh, yesterday, was in that uh, fateful um, plane that was shot down over the Ukraine. Um, I'll, uh, I'll give you a sample of another one. We have a few repeats here. There's Jennifer again, and a few judges, for example, a judge from Turkey we had. So you can see we had Singapore, Taiwan, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, Finland, Norway, Australia, Germany, the list goes on and on and on. And this is precisely what we wanted because being an international fish competition, we wanted to bring in international experts and it worked, it worked a treat. Uh, before judging got underway, we would address the judges and take, in, take them through the judging criteria. And we'll be showing you some of these judging criteria because uh, it's not an easy matter being a judge at any show, at any show. But when you're being a judge at a professional international show where there's, there's so much at stake, then it's extremely challenging. It's great fun but it's very challenging. So after we briefed the judges, they would sit down together. There's the, the table for the discus judges. They would go through their criteria and then they, not us, they would decide how do we go about the best way of doing this. And there were all sorts of different techniques. For example, with discus, there were so many that uh, we used to give the judges stickers, different colored stickers. And they would go around and any fish which they felt should be judged, they would put a sticker on the tank. If a tank had two or more stickers, that fish would be judged. And then the really, really detailed uh, judging would get underway. And this would take, what well, would take all day. It was such a complicated, there were so many fish to judge. In this particular case, these judges were looking at vetters. Now, we, the, uh, the organizers of the competition, did not dictate the standards for the better competition. These standards were the International Better Congress standards, and those were employed, and there were usually about 300 uh, um, betters to, to be judged. That they took forever to judge them. Okay, let's go. These two judges, Bahrain, and Australia, Josiah Pitt and Hamid Alawi, judging the marine aquaria. And as you see, they would open the door and have a look at the equipment, see how the sump had been set up, uh, judge the water quality, uh, judge how compatible the, the stuff was, judged to see if there was any illegal stuff that was CITES Appendix 1 and should not be there. And they never found anything illegal. So that was very hugely comforting because people would follow the rules that we dictated to them before the show. Um, international here, this is the new species. Um, there's our president again, and Vivo Pereira from, uh, from Sri Lanka. Okay, now, what I've got in the next few slides is just a rundown, a very, very small summary, brief summary of the categories of fish and the classes that form part of the competition. This, in the dragonfish, we had two classes. We just put them as large size and small size. The small size, but look at the size of the small size. They were 30 to 45 centimeters whereas the large size was from 46 centimeters upwards. In discus, like 11 classes and 10 individual varieties, plus the commercial section, which these are commercial type discus, which I'll be talking about very briefly. The goldfish 14, large sizes over 14.1 centimeters, 
small sizes up to a plus commercial. Guppy, then we also had a commercial class. Um, Tetras, um, Plecos, Cichlids, Cichlids. We used to have loads and loads of Cichlids coming in. We had them in three, um, three groups, the African Rift Lake species, the non Rift Lake species, and South for it, sorry for South Central American and for a time when the flower bones were so popular we used to have a whole a whole class for for um, for flower bones. Um, interesting that the categories also reflected the commercial interest worldwide because when it came to the gouramis by far the most popular type of gourami was the dwarf gourami. So we had a class exclusively dedicated to dwarfs and all the others fell into, into another class. Uh, platys, short tails, new species. Now we brought in the new species and varieties because we needed to bring in, we felt we needed to bring in fresh elements. What was new in the trade? Because for example, uh, exporters in, in India, they were sending out fish that we had never seen before. So those fish needed to be seen. And Aquarama was the place to show them. Then all the time, varieties were being cultivated. New varieties were being cultivated. These two needed to be given uh, a shop window. So that's why we included this. But look what I told you about the betters. 37 classes, four divisions, half moon short tail, half moon delta tail, crown tail, short fin, and so on and so on and so forth. So these were the categories of fish. But in addition to that, we also had uh, um, other ca competition categories. There was a freshwater nano. As soon as the nano aquaria started becoming popular, we felt they needed uh, a shop window and we needed to show what was possible with these small aquaria. And it was magnificent what happened. And, and we also had uh, marine nanos because, uh, and the marine nanos were particularly difficult to judge because things that you can put in, in a normal size marine aquarium, you can't put into a nano aquarium for size and for all sorts of reasons. So the judges have to be very, very careful on how, on how to ju judge that one. I'm pleased I never judged that. Look at this, freshwater planted tanks, wonderful stuff and uh, the marine tanks that I uh, was telling you about before. Then and at the last event we included, because they were growing in popularity, we included crystal bee shrimps and we were inundated with entries. Um, and all the entries were from, from Asia uh, and some spectacular tiny little jewels like this one. Overall, just to knock everything into some sort of sense before I show you the criteria, um, there were three main groups all that we used to judge. The general appearance of the, of the fish, um, we allocated 40% of the miles, and what, that would include the head, the body, and the health of the fish. Color, pattern, and finish, 20. That means for the color of the fins, the regularity of the patterns, the depth of color and so on. And then the show quality and commercial potential, but because don't let's forget that it, we're talking about a trade show here. So there are lots of buyers coming in from overseas to have a look at what's on show. They needed to learn what was the latest stuff that was coming onto the market. So we had to show them uh, material that had commercial potential and that had to be judged as well. Um, so. So here, consistency and marketability. I'll, I'll come back to that in, a, in just a few moments time. Okay, but just to show you an example of what, what, what we mean. Uh, in the goldfish, there were the individual categories and classes. In this particular case, this was the Ryukin short-tailed class. And these are massive fish, as you can see, massive. Uh, but these are not the fish that are seen in shops. These are fish for specialists and specialist hobbyists. And there are specialist breeders, mainly in the Far East. So these are big fish and they're worth a lot, a lot of money. And this happens to be a particularly good specimen of, uh, of a Ryukin uh, with a hump, a circular body, high fin there, fantail, double anal, 
double double cord or double anal, um, the pedal legs and so on. A gorgeous fish. But that, with that sort of quality, contrasts with commercial. Now, these are orange pantone oranda. And uh, as you can see, we've got a number of fish in the tank. And this was important because if you're a buyer and you're going to order orange fantail oranda, you want to make sure that what you get are orange fantail oranda and not an orange with a white head or white body, black spots or whatever. So if an exhibitor, a competitor is putting fish in, in the commercial class, that competitor, he or she has to be able to demonstrate that what they're offering are consistent. And this was the point about consistency that uh, I mentioned in, in the previous slide. Now, have a look at the criteria. Now you can see why it was so, so challenging. Um, individual marks, you know, for no when, that means no growth on the head as in an aranda, but I've only highlighted one here, that the body highly compressed, deep with overall body with head looking round like a disc and a pronounced hump. And as you can see, if I go back, there it is. This is precisely what was, what was looked for. And uh, that takes a lot of looking at and judging. But we have things for fins, for the color, for the way that the fish carry themselves, and uh, marketability. And when it comes to marketability, uh, those fish are only marketable to a very, very small niche of the market. And that niche market exists. Um, in fact, some people, some specialist hobbies concentrate on just, not just one variety, but one type. For example, there is the, the Oranda. Well, I visited a group in the UK that specialized in the Yokohama oranda. So only that type of oranda was bred by the members of that class. So there's a niche market there, which is made by specialist dealers. Um, and when it comes to commercial, there's what I was talking about. Specimens must be of a similar size, color, finish, etc. And there's the potential commercial value. And you can sell a lot more of these commercial fish than you can of the individual um, specialized ones. And here's a selection just of, of, of six of the sort of things that, you know, were regularly entered. Uh, and some of them you may be familiar with, others not. This is a cheeky, which looks almost like a goldfish, but has a double tail. A red and white uh, rancho with a little wen. Red cap oranda, there's the, the red cap. Um, black and gold telescope eye, telescope eye, black and gold oranda with wind. And then there's this chocolate orange pom-pom. And these are just six of the many, many varieties that, uh, that were entered in the competition. Um, discus, discus were particularly complicated because there's so much variety, even within one particular type. And, uh, and there's so much variety in the body shape, for example. Um, take this, body shape, good shape, round, so you would get more marks. Fairly good shape, slightly elongated. Poor shape, sometimes they were elongated in one, in one direction or in another. And all of these had to be given a mark. Um, here we are. Also for head and gills, look at the number of things that needed to be looked at for an individual fish. And uh, what I've selected here, because this was the red spotted judging criteria, you might quite rightly think that uh, if it's a red spotted fish, what about the spots is important? And what's important is that they must be numerous and small throughout the body, anal fins and dorsal fin with narrow stripes to form irregular patterns. That would carry the maximum marks, lower marks and lower marks. And if we go here, that's the commercial one. The same thing as with the goldfish. Specimens must be of similar size, color, finish, appearance, etc. And here they are. There's a red spotted one. Now look, isn't that beautiful? Even, even the faint vertical marks you can see going down the body 
but the spots are regular, evenly distributed. This is an absolutely super red spotted uh, discus. These are some of the others, solid red, solid blue. Let me come back again, solid blue. There's another red spotted where, where it's a bit more variegated. There, these are aquifaciatus with good vertical stripes, a solid white. Uh, this one going on a little bit towards the pigeon bloods and so on. But this is a small sample of what, what we had. And this at the commercial. This is a good selection of commercial quality discus because they're all the same. Here you can only see four fish, but there were more in this tank. But I took this picture because I thought this shows exactly what we mean by a commercial variety. So that if you as a buyer were ordering this I can't remember the actual name of this one, uh, whether it was gold, whether it was yellow, whether it was sand. Uh, I can't remember the exact name of the variety. But if you were ordering that, you need to be sure that you were getting that because then your customers needed to know what they were getting. Okay. Now to one of my favorite fish of all time, which is uh, the dragonfish. The dragonfish, which many people call uh, aruana, uh, it is not, it's the dragonfish. If something is going to be allowed, it would be Asian arowana. Um, but I got uh, a sharp lesson in that the very first time I visited what was the PPD primary production department. And a gentleman, George Day, was there. And I said, I'd be very interested in seeing some, uh, some aquaramas. And he said, don't call them aquarama. They're not, they're, they're, don't, sorry, don't call them arowanas. They're not arowanas. I said, well, aren't they? He said, no, they're dragonfish. Long year. They're not arowanas. Don't you ever call them that? And I learned my lesson then. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the bit that I've, I've selected the, the red ones and the bit that I've highlighted here is proportionate and symmetrical. That's a body shape without bulges or depressions and not deformed or stunted. Now that is important, as you will see, very important. Head, top of the head covered in black scales. This, these are the red ones on black scaling extending all along the back. Now there it is. That's a red dragonfish, a great one for all sorts of reasons. There are the black scales and you can't see them there. Well, perhaps you can a bit, but the light is too strong. But this had a beautiful row of black scales down the back. But what's significant here, look, very, very smooth from the head up to the nape and back. That is an excellent fish. Look at this one now. This is a not so good fish. Look at the depth of the body. It's not streamlined like that. And look at the forehead. It slumps. It's got a hump. There. <clears throat> what it's got going for it, which is very good, is that this is a, a golden crossback. And uh, the, the gold is crude, the head is black, the crossback. The crossback refers to the black spots are, 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 are along the back. But you can see, compare the two fish. And this is the sort of thing that the judges would be looking for. And this is the sort of thing that determines the price of a particular fish. A fish like that could be worth $20,000 more than that. That one, mm, I don't know. I wouldn't put a price on it. I wouldn't mind having it because it's magnificent, but uh, it's, it's, it's not in the same class. And look at this. In the last couple of years of, of Aquarama, a new variety of dragonfish appeared. The golden gold head. There you can see, golden and golden, gold head. And here again, I put two, for comparison purposes, two fish. One is a very, very good one. The, one, the other one is not so good. This one is good because it's gold all over. This one's not so good because look, there are a couple of black scales there. And this one would be marked down in competition. And this one, would that would affect the price of that fish. Whereas that one would have gone up and it would become, the price would have been, well, incredibly high. Okay, and these are some of the others. Um, I was a bit confused by, by one of these. That is that one. Well, perhaps someone listening to this talk may help clarify this one for me. 
because while all the others are typical spheropagids for Moses, that one has scaling that reminds me more of one or other of the Australian species of, of dragonfish. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Perhaps somebody watching can, can sort me out on that one. It's always puzzled me, that particular fish. It's beautiful though, isn't it? Look at the look at the markings on that. Look at the markings on that. I mean, just because it's got the markings and it would not win a competition, that doesn't mean that it's not a spectacular fish that could be had. Okay, here we go. Once all the marks, all the points had been scored, they would be taken into this panel. There's Jennifer Lee again, where all the results would be collated and the first, second and third winners in each category and each class was determined. And it was purely by numbers. Whatever fish had most marks was the winner. There was no debate over that. It was absolutely straight down the middle, honest, honest marking. And uh, once that had been done, here is the group of discus judges again, because among certain of the categories, discus, goldfish, dragonfish, marine tanks, guppies, <sighs> there was one, one other, one other one. From all the classes, all the class winners, all the number ones in each class, they had to be considered together and out of those fish, one grand champion had to be elected. Um, and this was again down to the judges and uh, the responsibility of these guys was, was tremendous, but they did a magnificent job. And it had to be done, the judging took place the day before the show opened. And it had to be done then because there's <coughs> our gentleman, Dr. Maliki again, uh, because at the opening ceremony, the grand champions would receive their major trophies. And this was a hugely prestigious event with all the press being there, television, radio, camera, and uh, these people deserved all the credit and all the, all the publicity they could get. And then later on in the show, we would present the prizes to all the others. And the gentleman from Sri Lanka kept winning and winning and winning. So uh, that was part of the prize giving. And then this gentleman, I showed you him in uh, one of the photographs of, uh, of the judges, Andrew Lim from Malaysia, because the judges were also acknowledged for, for their efforts. They would be given a token of appreciation. Jennifer is doing this to, to Anthony Lim, Andrew Lim. Uh, whereas in the competitions, uh, the fish competitions, apart from the trophies, there were also interesting um, cash prizes. Okay, now this is a look at the grand champions. Look at that. Isn't that a beauty? And that. Look at this black oranda. Look at the wen on that. Wonderful, wonderful fish. And uh, there's the dragonfish I showed you earlier. That was the grand, the, 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 the grand champion of the large size. Now, it won, but not because it belonged to the large size class, because on one occasion we had one from the small uh, size class. It was so good that it beat all the large ones to, to the top prizes. Okay, now, I was involved with the show up to 2015, and some of you may be wondering, so, so what happened to Aquarama after 2015? Well, the answer is quite simple. Aquarama was sold by the then owners, UBM Asia Trade Fairs, BT Limited, and it was acquired by the NU Exhibitions Asia Company Limited. So they bought the show and they took the show to China, where it now takes place. Um, apparently, I mean, I haven't been to it, but apparently it's still very, very successful. And I'm pleased to hear that because... Uh, Aquarama is something that's very, very close to my heart. So I'd like to think that its uh, success is continuing. Um, and uh, the last event was held on uh, between 31st May and 2nd June 2019. But 2020 hasn't been held yet. And of course, the pandemic is, is putting a break on this. But for any of you interested, uh, make a note of this. This is the website 
for Aquarama. The CN means it's, uh, it's China. Okay, so you can find out more about the show there. And I'd also like to extend an acknowledgement to UBM's Asia Trade Fairs Limited, not just for putting up with me for so many years, um, but uh, they were great. They would take all the con constructive criticisms I would make, they would take it on the chin. Very, very good. But also because they used to give me the slides of, uh, of each show for me to use in promotional purposes for Aquarama. And I've included some of those uh, photographs in this talk. And for that, I'm hugely grateful. Apart from talking and being in the business, I still keep fish, a lot of them. This is just my, my freshwater nano a cube. Um, I've got some Indian fishes here, mini, look, some Indian. And uh, this particular one, I've got cardinals. Um, I've got two cardinals that are about three and a half years old here. So I must be doing something right. Um, endless live bears, which look like guppies, but they're not. Uh, tiger bones and two bronze catfish. And I'd like to end with two votes of thanks. One is a thanks, thanks to you all who have been watching and listening to my talk. And uh, thank you, Minnie, for the invitation and your friendship. My wife and, uh, and I are very, very good friends with Minnie. And uh, I think she's done an absolutely marvelous job in, uh, in getting this thing underway. So that's the last of my slides. Now I need to know, now I've got to come out. Have a nine, Minnie. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I leave the show. Okay, the slideshow? Yes. Uh, okay, there I am. Uh, yes, uh, we can continue. Thank you. That was that was a, a highly informative. You know, you uh, gave a clear picture of the criteria of and of course it was very nostalgic. Do you agree, Sweet Pozo? Very nostalgic, very nostalgic. I, I'm sure Spain and Kapila, Kapila as well, and Shane would feel like that. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the Aquarama shows in Singapore is something uh, I think everyone who has been connected to it miss a lot. So we are still searching for the, an alternative that gathers as many people together as, as they uh, succeeded with in Singapore. I should say that there was a show in two, uh, 2017 in Singapore, which was called Aqua Realm. I was involved with that one as well, but it was a much, much smaller event. And uh, being a much smaller event, it didn't attract the same number of uh, international exhibitors or fish competition. And of course, um, it's a very difficult balancing act. There's a critical number. If you're traveling half the world, to exhibit or visit a show, you're going to Singapore, it's expensive. And uh, if you go there as a buyer, well, you need to have a lot of exhibitors. If you go as an exhibitor, you need a lot of buyers. And there's a critical number at which it tips in favor of the show or not. And that balance wasn't quite hit in 2017. So everything is in a bit of limbo at the moment, especially with, uh, with the pandemic. Would you like to add something? Um, I think uh, John has uh, done it completely, but I can just, uh, I'm going back in my mind. I think it would have been 1989 when I first met John at Aquarama. It was yes. Mr. Yes, it was Mr. Rodney Jonkless that took me as a novice there. And uh, it, it was really interesting because all the eight serious exporters from Sri Lanka at that time, we had a common stall there. And in 91, if I'm not mistaken, I was also able to do the keynote editors at the culture session of the, of the seminars. So it's actually, and uh, most of the friends that I have in... Um, 
uh, in the industry now. We have uh, we started our friendships at uh, at Aquarama, and it, it, it was really uh, interesting. It's a pity, and we miss it now. We miss the absence of Aquarama. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's interesting, Kapila, that uh, those uh, friendships that we forged so long ago, eighty nine and ninety one, that they still they still maintained today. And we're still in contact with each other. Um, I mean, I've got two of you here on screen that I can see. <laughs> we're in regular <laughs> contact. Yes, uh, that was 1989. We go back a long way. Um, and what you mentioned about Sri Lanka uh, reminds me that the Aquarama, because, I mean, my talk wasn't about Aquarama so much as concentrating more, as many asked me to do on, on the criteria. But uh, the Aquarama, we had these pavilions, if you remember. And yes. there was a Sri Lankan pavilion where all the Sri Lankan exhibitors would get into this section of the hall. That's what's dedicated to them. There was another pavilion for Singapore, another pavilion for Thailand, and so on. Yeah, as as Sven said, nostalgic. We miss it. I was a research student in my university, uh, studying research in ornamental indigenous ornamental fishes of Kerala. My professor, Dr. Ramachandran, he always told me, Aquarama is the place you should reach. So it always remained as a destination where, where I should reach. And uh, I, don't, I didn't know how I would reach there, but I was working really hard in my fish collection, my, all my research activities. And it was after research and then four years, 2011 was my first Aquarama. And all my growth from there, is attributed to meeting all the experts in the field, the best of fishes, best of farms, trade, everything. Uh, I just visited three, three as uh, invited speaker. I wonder how many Swain would have visited. I'm not quite sure how many, but uh, I think my first may have been uh, 99, oh, it was earlier, 97, probably. So, and after that, I attended it all. Yeah, you were a regular visitor and a regular contributor to the seminars and to the judging and, uh, and to everything we, we used to have and Kapila as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned something, many about uh, visiting some farms. Again, of course, because I had to concentrate mainly on the, on the criteria. Um, I couldn't talk about it, but those, those farm tours, they were eye-openers, they were highly educational as to what, what, uh, what the industry is about. Yeah, yeah, very pleased about that. And now we're all nostalgic, and now we all cry on each other's shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> no. Mini, uh, may I? Uh, yes, please. Yes, I, please. I, I, just uh, listening to John and missing uh, all the experiences we had in Aquarama, the farm visits, the exhibition itself, has given me uh, an idea to um, a responsibility for ability for you. Is uh, a, a, about a few weeks ago, Japan, a, a car manufacturer, uh, manufacturer in Japan. Uh, who is to have these biennial um, exhibitions of their cars, uh, had an uh, exhibition, organized an exhibition online. Right? So, Bini, I think it's your next step to uh, have something like that, you know, organize the exhibition. Uh, uh, we'll, we, we will uh, all the, sit together and discuss uh, how we are going to do and what we are going to do in that. Um, everybody can uh, upload uh, maybe video clips of their fish and have a competition, judge them online. I mean, this just came into my mind because as we cannot uh, meet physically for seminars, we are doing this. And uh, why not we extend this uh, idea to an exhibition, an online exhibition? What do you think about yeah, it? I, I, I haven't got a clue on how, on how we would do it. <laughs> As far, as far as the idea is concerned, of course, I know I, I'm very positive about these things. Um, how we would do it, um, I would have to rely on the expertise of other people. Uh, well, well uh, I'd like to uh, tell you something. 
uh, when this idea of uh, uh, webinar an online conference came into my mind as a you know a dream i kept asking all our speakers initially everybody were like should we will we will it be possible each day we were talking about it and this has come possible you know mm -hmm. so dream something will be possible you know i don't know how many days we will have to sit like this um, till then we have to be uh, doing things keep it, keep doing things while we, we move forward mm -hmm. we have to do that um, we'll do we'll keep doing things if opportunity comes so with all your support each one of you held my hands and came together with school of industrial fisheries and kochi university all the speakers were like yes mini we will go for it so that support with that support we were uh, able to make this sofi 2020 a success so yes let's think let's uh, think about it forward if we are to have to sit here like this inside the house we have responsibilities for towards the trade we have responsibilities to the towards the youngsters we have a lot of responsibilities so we need now this is a give back time from our side mm -hmm. you have rich experience expertise i i have learned from each one of you now it's time to give back when we are sitting like this we need to take this thing serious that yes, you, 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 like you, you need to teach us you need to teach us i notice that jennifer has has joined joined us now i can't okay. see her, her 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 picture but i see her name as um, somebody down, down there as a, as a guest jennifer lee Yes, yes, Jennifer. Hi. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hi, John. Long time no see. Long time no see, Jennifer. <laughs> Great to there see you. There is a project manager. She was a project manager of Equarama. Oh, yeah. Me? Hello, Hello sir Kapila. <laughs> Hi, Spain. Hi, Jennifer. We were just talking about having something like Equarama online, and you suddenly come up. Because you have all that experience doing it physically, and now we know of you. Yeah, we so we uh, let, let's think seriously about this and organize something online. A very good international exhibition uh, of fish. Uh, I just saw a very beautiful, uh, I mean, very well organized uh, exhibition of international exhibition of cars in uh, NHK Japan uh, TV uh, 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 channel. So uh, I think it should be possible for us to do this with all our. I have done. I, I have done the conference. I have done the conference. <laughs> so, <laughs> <For> have, all... <laughs> so you have to go go further, one step further, one step further. Maybe. No exhibition. She, uh, you, you, you uh, Jennifer and Chief can think about. <laughs> Guy, Gayatri would like to add something. Gayatri would like to add something about Ekorama experiences. Uh, How did you I mean, I <laughs> thank, thank you very much, uh, Mini. So I, I was following through the YouTube, and uh, now I'm just joining in, in a Zoom. So I, I'm thinking, like you know, because this is the seafood show, they do it virtually. So is there any plan to do this uh, Aquarama virtually? You know, you, you you visit the Boston uh, virtual the seafood yes. show, yeah, Mini. Yes. So yes, you know, guess. probably you know. We can do that for the for the for the ornamental fish. Yeah, you <laughs> so. are. Thank you, Gayatri. I mean, <laughs> Mini needs Mini needs some uh, push and support in the beginning, and then she will drag us all uh, to where we need to go. Yeah. Yes. So I mean, Mini, you 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 know you organize this virtually. So let's 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 you know you can try that. I mean, we. Can support you. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure we can all. We, we all have something to contribute. But in yeah. my particular case, I would um, undoubtedly need the expertise of people who can organise this sort of thing. I I haven't got a clue. Mm -hmm. But we, Jennifer, we need... Jennifer does. But <laughs> because organising Aquarama was, uh, I think, if we were to say that it was a substantial challenge, that would be putting it very mildly. Yes, we're in contact every day, and uh, you have no idea how complex it was, and how this woman sailed through it without uh, suffering a nervous breakdown. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> that's the fun part of organizing an exhibition. <laughs> yeah. 
So, yes. so nice to see you guys. If if John and Swain, all of all of you are there with us, yes, we will think about it. We'll start dreaming something because Dream. it will reach. It will reach. I tell you, this reach for this particular conference. I'm amazed. When I started, I thought it will be like few hundreds, two hundreds. This conference, we got a registration of one thousand five hundred participants. That took from. 38 countries. This is like, I can't imagine. So this is just a start. Sophie 2020 was just a start and you know, this is the, so things might happen. With support from all of you, let's keep discussing. Yes. The possibilities. Yep, we can keep our minds open for sure. Yeah, I, I, it's working, it's working well. I mean, uh, I'm sure we all agree that it's working very well. And I'm sure we'd all, we all agree that it's been great fun, you know, joining in and, um, and, and sharing things. Uh, it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful because we still have one more day to go. Yes, we have all met each other after a long time, six, seven months. Mm -hmm. We are all meeting together and looking at each other itself. It, makes, <laughs> it gives us so much happiness. And listening to the speeches, when so many people listen to your speeches, like uh, in, any any small shows, they just it was less than five hundred or two hundred so. But now the number of people who have heard your expertise, experience, lectures, yes, that will guide them forward. So we need to give back now. Give back time. Yes, uh, there is a question coming from Karen. Can you ask? Unmute yourself and ask Karen. Yeah, sorry, yes, no problem. I'll even turn the video on. Um, so thank you, John, for um, giving me an insight into yeah. the scale of um, the, the interest in uh, ornamental fish, but also the passion that people feel for, um, for this uh, area as well. So it, it was wonderful to see some of your um, pictures um, of all of these species. So it was very interesting. I just wanted to come back to one question and you raised it yourself, that um, the difference between Asian arowana and uh, dragonfish, or whether they were the same species or not. No, no, um, no, 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 no. This is a long, I know this is a long running discussion. There was a, no, it, was all, no, no. it was formerly one species, but now split. So no, I noticed no. that we, we have, the same names in our species plus we have the same names associated to both species mm. of formosus and inscriptus but which, which is which should be right which so we can correct this yeah well it's it's a bit of a complicated affair well uh, the one thing that i don't think anybody should do is simply talk about dragonfish as as arowana arowana no um uh, it would be more correct for the South American ones, Arwana, to be, you know, the osteoglossum, um, to be the Arwanas. But if, if the word is going, the term is going to be used for the Asian uh, one, like the, the dragonfish, it would be the Asian Arwana. Um, but dragonfish, I think, is, is preferable. But there's now inscriptors, and of course there was debate as to how many species of square pages there were, um, and so on. And I showed a photograph there of one of them you've mentioned, which might have had some inscriptors in it. I don't know, but it had some, some sort of streaking on, 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 on the body that made it a very, very interesting fish. Um, but that debate will go on for, for quite some time because although there were five species of sclerapages uh, proposed, the red one, the gold one, the blue one, the, yeah, um, to what extent they've been universally accepted, I don't know, because I haven't checked recently in fish base to see where, how many, you have, Swain, um, to see how many have been actually acknowledged, but Spain is signaling that uh, he, he probably has the answer. Well, uh, I, I, I was actually raising my hand to, to add to the discussion, but not specifically on what fish base says on the nomenclature, but uh, since it was Karen who raised the question, I can say, uh, tell uh, you that uh, I was actually in the nomenclature working group uh, for CITES when 
uh, inscriptus uh, was discussed and I was completely in agreement that we should under Cites accept that there are two species, Formosus, which was described already in 1840 or thereabout, and Inscriptus that was described by Tyson Roberts in 2012, I think, uh, because Inscriptus was unanimously accepted by the scientific community as it's, it's so different from Formosus in, in vital uh, coloration. Uh, but what I advised against and which the rest of the working group agreed on was that we should not accept in CITES context uh, the species that were proposed by uh, uh, Poyad Sudato. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The uh, beginning of the 2000s, 2002, 2003, because they are not generally accepted and in using all those species in situs would make trade in scleropagus utterly complicated because no one knows which of those possible species that uh, Teugels and, and his colleagues described uh, that has gone into the crosses that, that are now in trade. Uh, so scientists have always been very conservative when it comes to, to the nomenclature. Scientists is the last to accept new uh, nomenclature uh, ideas after revisions. And it has to be like that because uh, the trade system is conservative by nature and, and if you should jump on every new uh, revision that is done in nomenclature, exporters would not have a chance of, of explaining what they are trading in. Uh, does that in any way uh, answer your question, Karen? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, yes, it, it, it is. I, I mean, I understand how the nomenclature uh, working group uh, operates. Um, and I understand that, of course, we, yes, we need um, timestamped versions of everything. So it's only at each COP that we consider updating um, references. But we are looking to, at the possibility of using online databases to have more up to date. But you're right, uh, up to date references or, um, sorry, taxonomy. But these things, they're, it's a movable feast. They change um, constantly. And I know there is some work going on um, uh, at a global level to try and come up with a standard taxonomy, but that, that is not something that's going to happen overnight. And you're right, the trade, the trade needs to be have um, you know, fixed guidance on this is what they need to follow from now until the next COP, and then now we have a new set, rather than not knowing where they're supposed to find what names they were supposed to be using. So yeah, it is very complicated. I guess yeah. it's just that my question is because the um, Formosus was, um, or Inscriptus was recognized as a separate species. I just noticed that on Species Plus, the list of uh, common names for both species is identical. So I'm that's what I'm trying to figure out is, uh, should one of them be, um, assigned a particular common name and, and a different common name to the other because this is very confusing to somebody well, when they're you know uh, you're recognizing yeah. two different species but you're given the same English yeah. you know English French and Spanish names so yeah. well in Singapore and China um, the dragonfish um, now Jennifer is going to correct my pronunciation um, <laughs> but uh, it's referred to as long Yue. Now, that is not used for any other yeah. uh, Asian arowana. And when I refer to uh, being complicated at the beginning, I mean, uh, Svein highlighted something which is very, very relevant, which is inscriptus and formosus. Fine, they're different, no problem. But when you read the original descriptions of all the other supposedly new species, the, the, the feeling that you get as a biologist is that there's enough 
flexibility and variation with, within all of these to make any difference or some of the differences quite nebulous and quite difficult to grasp. Um, and uh, having five, six different um, dragonfish or Asian arowanas um, within CITES and within the trade would just confuse matters enormously when I think it could work with just the uh, inscriptors and formosas. Uh, how, Jennifer, how, how did I pronounce it? Uh, Sclerophages are recognized at the moment. Sorry? How many species are recognized at the moment within the Sclerophages? Well, there's uh, inscriptors, there's Sclerophages, uh, um, for Moses, there was Scleropages Lichardi. Um, and one more, I can't remember. I, I, I think, uh, John, that, that the species recognized by everyone is for Moses and Inscriptus, mm -hmm. yeah. where Inscriptus was, you, was until Tyson Roberts described it, regarded as a subpopulation or a geographical mm -hmm. variety of Formosus. Mm -hmm. And it's the Australian ones, uh, the, the Jardiniae and Lycartae. Uh, the three species that were described by, by uh, Teugels and colleagues are not, I think, still generally regarded as valid species. Uh, but they were Macrocephalus, uh, Legendriae, and Aureus. And, and, and they are not, not generally accepted. So I, I, I think, Karen, that uh, Cites should, at least for the time being, uh, consider that Scleropagus formosus covers those other three species, and that Scleropagus inscriptus, if you want another common name, I think Myanmar, uh, uh, Arowana or scripted Arowana are the two names most commonly used in literature. Yeah, the scripted Arowana is in fact uh, a nice descriptive one of what, yeah. of what the species looks like. But so is actually Myanmar uh, arowana because it's, I think it's the only Scleropagus that mm -hmm. is found in Myanmar. Okay. The Inscriptus, is it? Inscriptus. Uh, I'll read you, I'll read you. The, this is the list of names it has for Inscriptus, is the Asian arowana, arowana, uh, Kalisa, uh, Malayan bony tongue, uh, Asian bony tongue, dragonfish, golden arowana and golden dragonfish. But it's exactly the same list for Formosus. So I'm, I know you're telling me that it's easy to distinguish them, but I, I actually don't know how. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, the Inscriptus has a very different color pattern that you don't find in Formosus. Uh, but as for common names, it's, it's not that uncommon that two different species have the same common name. Uh, and Inscriptus is, as far as I know, not captive bred at all, as uh, it didn't get out of uh, Myanmar in any quantities before it was uh, rightfully uh, recognized by Citus and, and included with Formosus on, on Appendix 1. Okay, no, that, so, that, that helps, yeah. I think just yeah. even knowing the res really restricted distribution of Inscriptus to Myanmar um, yeah. will help make that distinction. Yeah, so uh, apologies for uh, having a very long conversation about this, but I was just curious. Um, That's about, why yeah, you, that. you... No, this is wonderful. It's a way to have discussions. Yeah. <laughs> yes. A lot of time for discussions. <laughs> no issue. All right. So, thank you all. Thank you all once again. Uh, tomorrow, I hope you all join the morning talk by Timela Morgan. Uh, thank you, John, for this effort you have put in. Uh, My pleasure. Yes. Shall we close the session for the day? Sure.
Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Thank Jonathan. Good to see you, everybody. Thank you, John. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Jennifer. Lovely Bye. seeing you. Lovely to see all of you. Take care. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye.